<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Cultural Awareness, the podcast that allow you to travel across the world. All of this from the backseat of your car, the comfort of your home, or maybe your neighbor house. Who knows? Wherever you are, welcome. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. I'm your host, Big Steph. Okay, guys, if this is your first time coming into my podcast, again, welcome, sit back, relax, and uh, have some fun, man. And if you have any suggestion and everything, you know, you can contact me on my Instagram page, bsteph77. You can contact me on my uh, uh, Twitter page, at Stefan Nembot. You can pretty much contact me on my Facebook pages also, which is uh, uh, Stefan Nembot, yeah, on Facebook. And uh, that being said, let's get right to it, right? So today I wanted to talk a little bit about economics, yeah, economics or financing. Because I have sit back and watch a little bit on how each, uh, how can I say, each culture interact with each other. Let's start with the Asian culture. I realize that every time they move somewhere, they are never alone. Right, he might own a liquor store down the street, and his country fellow man might own, uh, let's say, a nail polish or like a spa down the street. Another person might own a little restaurant, another person, and they all like live within the community, right? So, whenever the person needs his spa, he goes to his brother that has a spa. Whenever that brother that has a spa is hungry, he goes to his brothers also down the street that own a restaurant. So, it's always like that money is always, always staying among themselves. Like, why is that? You know, this is cultural awareness, and we are here to, you know, talk about everything. We talk about finances, tradition, and everything. So let's talk a little bit about why that is. The first thing is, when you're in your country outside of the U.S., they are used into living in community, right? Living in community is a good thing. It has its perks. It has its uh, consequences. But most of the time, it has its perks. So when you're moving in community, like let's say, uh, one of your neighbor move here and they come here and they will and his family say well uh our neighbor over there has a son over there that live in the US right it would be good if you can spend maybe a week or so or a couple of months just a time for you to figure out what you want to do or figure out yourself as a person in a new country. So when they get here, they already have somebody to greet them. I mean, not like me. I went straight to boarding school, boarding school. But anyway, uh, they, when they come here, they have someone to greet them and everything. That person kind of show them the way. He showed them like if you want to do this. And you know, when you make money, you, you pay your your taxes but you also try to give back the same way that those people that were ahead of you gave back to you so it's always a cycle it's always something that continue and i realized that it happened a lot not just with the asian community but also with like let's say uh Indian community, Jewish community, and now a lot of uh, Nigerian and Ghanaian people are doing it also, right? Because we are used to live, even I from myself, uh, for myself, I'm from Cameroon, so even I, we are used to live in the community. Now, when you come over here, if you have people from your country, you usually tend to associate with them. Why? Because they understand you. They understand your culture. They understand where you guys are from. It's a lot more difficult to integrate like people think. Like people think, oh, you just come here. All you have to do is speak English and that's it. Right? No, it doesn't happen like that. So because it doesn't happen like that, how do you survive? How do you, I don't know, go on this quest of making money on this quest of uh, finding yourself to where you will be financially stable and at the same time like having a family having people you can rely on and everything well like we said the Asian community they get together some of the Indian together family actually moving into the same house together you might go in one house and you might see like 10 11 people and as they start making money, they 
put money together to buy one house. They work, they work, they work, they put money together. Everybody knows his contribution. Everybody has an amount of money that he's supposed to bring in. Once that amount of money reach the price of buying a home, we get one home and we we'll put that person all the way until that house empty out. Now, when families from back home want to send somebody there like, hey, such and such gave you a favor. Now you also have to give us a favor. And that's how the cycle continues. Indian people do it. Jewish people, you know it, right? You pay your your tribute. They are, they are, I, I, I am amazed and fascinated by uh, the Jewish culture because, yes, they put God ahead of everything, which is a must for me. But most of um, um, the most important thing that I see is Picture this, right? Every Jewish man that considered themselves a Jew, they put a certain percentage that goes to their uh, church or their mosque or however they call it. Uh, I, I don't know if it's the mosque, the mosque is mostly Muslim, but you know, to their church, we will call it church, but they don't call it church. So, or their temple. Right, so they all put a certain percentage of their salary to go toward their temple, and their temple kind of use that money not only to build it and uh, better the conditions, the building of the temple, but they also use that same amount of money to help all the Jewish people move into the U.S. And that cycle continues. If you're doing that, why shouldn't your community be successful? They have the art of helping each other, right? They know how to help each other. And they don't <clears throat> overlook somebody just because right now he doesn't have anything. Why? Because they know in the future, Jewish people are smart, right? They they know in the future, I'm not saying that there's anybody out there, any culture out there that is not smart, but we also have to recognize that they are well organized, right? If they are well organized, give them their prop. They are well organized. They know how to take care of each other. Asian, Chinese especially, they know how to do the same thing also. They take care of each other. And Indian, you have it? I don't know. I have realized a lot in the U.S. A lot of the liquor stores are either owned by either Asian, like Chinese, or owned by Indian. A lot of the 7-Eleven are owned by uh uh, how should I say, by uh, Indian people, right? I actually try myself many times to get into 1711. I've been trying hard, but I think maybe my money is not uh, up to where it needs to be. So that's why I'm here working hard and trying to figure my, find my way, should I say. You know what I mean? So that was a little bit of the economic part. So that being said, in California, in precisely a place called Glendale, California, because I used to live in Los Angeles and I kind of know a lot, there's also a community, the uh, not the Persian community, right? Like people from Iran, and I realized they also do the same thing, right? And they are very, very successful. They drive nice car, they do everything right, you know, like. They make their money. They're all about their work and everything. And I always wonder, why is it that they have a tendency, like a lot of these international people have a tendency of coming together and making something happen, not just for themselves, but for the entire community and for those that will follow in their footsteps. I realize it has to do with the way they were raised. The way you raise change a lot of things in your life, right? We are the product of our environment. If you grew up in a community where everything is shared, everything is, uh, that doesn't mean that you don't work for yourself. You work for yourself and your kid, but you have that sense of, I need to give to those who do not have anything, right? I need, like, if my neighbor, if I have a bottle of rice in my house or a bag of rice and my neighbor doesn't have anything, it's okay for me to share with him because I have more than he does, right? So, that is the same type of culture that they grow up knowing. And when they come in the U.S., that thing continues. Because as long as they stick together, you know you do not mess with their community. They know they can claim things. Like, you know, it's like a syndicate. Whenever a syndicate comes together and try to claim for something, people pay attention. People listen to them. It's, it is the same thing. That is why you want to get into 
a community like you know things feel like a sense of belonging to something uh and that being said i realized something recently if you are rich if you became successful as an immigrant how do you stay rich what helped you get there besides the people that obviously we are talking about kind of show you a way Number one thing in finance, you need to learn how to not spend a lot of money and how to save your money, right? Let's stay a little bit on that topic, right? I realize a lot of Africans, when they come here, they live in a very, very, not just African, most people coming from the outside of the U.S., they know how hard, it is hard, man. It is hard in the U.S. to get some money. It is hard. Like there's better opportunity, obviously here than we have in our countries and like back home, or whether you are Asian and whether you are, I don't know, Indian, uh, Persian, or African. It's it's hard. It's, it's hard outside. So the U.S. for sure provide you with multiple opportunity, but you just gotta know which one works for you, right? And that being said, if Oh, sorry, I keep saying that being said. But anyway, uh, if it's, it is hard to get money and everything, once you have it, you got to find a way not to spend it. A lot of international people live in a very frugal manner, right? I remember, yeah, it's okay to be frugal because you can be frugal for a certain number of years that allow you to set yourself, right? Yeah, they, they used to have this musician making jokes saying that... Uh, uh, in that in Europe they see like uh, a black man who has like nothing. He looks like he has nothing. He, he you know, he's out there with uh, clothes that are not nice and everything. But once you look at his house, you understand this man is just not anybody because they have the art of saving, right? How do you save your money? Number one, learn how to not spend it. Number two, find a way to invest in something, right? Uh, there's this app, and I'm not here to give them commercial. I mean, even if I was giving them commercial, hey, nobody's paying me, nobody sponsorized me. So there's this app that myself I discovered when I was in in college or in my end career with the NFL. There's this app called Robinhood where you can invest. There's this app called Stash where you can invest. There's another app called, uh, uh, I forgot the name of it. It's like a green app like this. I forgot the name. Uh, that you can also use it to invest. But let's talk about Robinhood, for example. You don't have to know anything about investing to do Robinhood. First of all, it's free. Hey, anything, anytime something is free, hey, you, you can call me to the table. If it's free, no risk, hey, call me to the table, man. I will be there if it's free. So the app is free, just like Stash. Those apps are free. And you don't have to be a professional. You can start with like $500 and like figure a way how you can buy a stock. Like usually what I advise people, is if you don't know how to invest in stock, the best thing to do with Robinhood is to buy stock that you know will be here for a while like when i first got into it uh there are some app like i mean what am i saying there are some uh companies like apple that i invested in right i bought like 20 share of apple at the time i believe the share was uh, a one share was like 167 dollars and i even did it late i, I regretted not buying even more because now when i buy an app I, I bought like 20 share 167 share uh 167 dollars should i say per share now a share is about like 360 dollars and this is like a year and a half ago there's no bank in the U.S. that will give you that kind of return on your money, right? So, yes, it's a gamble. But if you want to be on the safety net side, if you don't want to be risky at all, invest in company that you know will be here for a while, like Google, Apple. And the best of all, I mean, I know it's a lot of money because you have to get to a certain point. To Even I, I'm not rich, man. I only bought four share, And I bought a share at the time at... 1805 a share. I only bought four share of Amazon. 1805. 
Amazon right now is almost three thousand dollar a share. Can you believe that? Tell me what bank will give you that kind of return? Uh, no, there's none of those banks that give you that kind of return, right? Because you might get like at worst you might get like one percent or one point seven five percent. You won't get that kind of return on your money. So. My advice is, you know, invest in something, invest in something. Now, let's talk about, like, let's put investing on the side. Start project, man. Even if you don't think it will make money, start it just because failure will give you other ideas that you did not think of, right? You know, uh, like, for example, before I started this podcast, man, I got to tell you this. <laughs> I have taken so many projects and my host family, my mom, Lori, my nurse, she always was like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Like, I was like, why is she always saying, uh-huh? because you will start and fail. You will always start and fail. Not, it's like, you might start 10 things and there's only one of them that actually take off, right? So, first, I wanted to invest in the weed business when I was in college because I, th- I saw that uh, Colorado would legalize weed in i believe it was like i don't know 2011 and i remember talking people about it they were like no it's not gonna happen we've been talking about it for a year but they finally did it right and i wanted to do that well uh i wanted but i didn't take any action we regretted it because a lot of people that took action today they are millionaires they are not doing podcasts they're living well okay so regretted not taking action on that one uh number two uh, what other action? I actually took a training to sell on Amazon to a point where I even had my logo, everything ready to launch on the market. Even though I figured later on, mm, I will have to put this on a post. I paid, I believe, uh, $5,000 to learn how to, you know, up- do your business on Amazon. They teach you how to, like... So, you know, so it's called investing in yourself, right? Because you're investing in yourself, like a skill that will allow you to make money, right? So I took it and figured it wasn't what I wanted to do because as soon as I took it and I started uh, ordering sample from like uh, Alibaba in in China and everything, guess what happened? The coronavirus started. So I was buying like a, a purse or a a shoe for like four ninety nine, but I was paying taxes to sh- and everything to bring it here in the U.S. Pay shoe at like twenty five dollar. I was like, man, what? How am I gonna buy a pair of shoe for like four ninety nine and bring it here, like for like twenty five dollars? So and you know, so every pair you gotta add it on every pair you buy. So if you buy, let's say you you want to start your sample with like three hundred pairs of shoes. How much taxi do you think it would take you to bring it here in the U.S.? Because at the time, oh, it still is. Uh, the U.S. imposed a, a t- extra tariff on every product that is coming from China. So I decided to just put it on hold. You know, things happen in life. I, here I am. I took a $5,000 training just to put it on hold, right? Because financially, it wasn't allowing me to make any profit for the time being. So, that is two projects already. I have started countless projects, man. There's another project of uh, uh, real estate that I'm actually doing right now. I'm taking my uh, my license to get into the Texas real estate just because I have realized, I, and for some reason, God always showed me the vision, right? I keep messing it up. I realize, or oh, my vision is, a lot of people are shifting from Los Angeles or from California in general to Dallas, Texas, and I want to get in that real estate just so, you know, I can be, you know, one day a pioneer of real estate in the U.S. where, you know, they are like, yeah, he has over 500 uh, 500 homes and he's making such and such million a year so i'm still doing it right now because obviously he's investing in myself even if i might not use it later on i might still get my less my license just for in case you know what i mean and it takes you about 180 hours of uh online courses and then you will take the final exam still Right after you then do all these hundred and eighty hours, so I'm still doing it. You know, I'm I'm learning on it right now. And also, I started a YouTube. <laughs> I started a YouTube podcast, uh, not a YouTube channel, and 
I was getting like 45 views, right? So I was like, man, I'm killing myself here for 45 views. So from time to time, I still post on YouTube just for fun, just because I'm not looking for the viewer anymore. I just post whatever I find funny or is making me laugh or I find inspiring, right? My point is, you would take a lot of projects. And yeah, by the way, you are listening to my podcast right now. This is one of those projects also. So you always got to take projects that allow you to uh, invest in yourself. You invest in yourself, you will be successful. So uh, that is it in terms of finance. Now, I feel like I talk a lot and let's go on story of the day. Hey, yo, boss. Where is the commercial? We ain't got none. We got to work harder. In today's story of the day, so this lady or this woman is writing because uh, she feels as if her husband is not helping with the education of the kids. What she mean by that is she feels like every time when the kids do something that is not right and not good, she has to always be the one stepping in, like either blaming or beating the kids because they are not behaving well. And she feels like every time, whenever she brings the problem to her husband, he just stay quiet. Like, for example, the other day, one of the kids, she realized, like, uh, one of her niece moved in the house. And she said the niece is perfect. The niece is doing everything well. She has raised the other, she's helping raise the other younger kid. So the niece is like 19 years old. And the other kids are like around like five, six, seven. So, you know, so she, she, she's doing her part by helping her raise her own kid. But the problem is, she said, like, for the past three months, she realized that money from time to time is missing in the house. She knows that it's not, or she thinks it's not those seven-year-old kids that are taking the money. And she brought the problem to the attention of her husband, which he asked, are you sure that uh, you placed it in the right place or you did not use it? And she said, no, I am sure of where I put the money and it disappeared. So you have to step in and say something. The husband did not step in. He did not do anything. And he just asked questions to make sure that, you know, uh, she may not have forgotten that she used the money or she may have misplaced the money. And... She said that was number one. Another time, uh, she felt like her niece that is 19 year old, when it was like, uh, when like a, like a time to go to like a party, like a family party, you know, family dinner. The niece didn't want to go. She decided she she would stay home. So when she stayed home, she ended up going outside and slept outside with her boyfriend without the mother of the house or the, you know, the man of the house knowing. So when she got back, they asked her, where were you? And she said she was downstairs because apparently it's a two-story building when, in fact, they had already looked downstairs and she wasn't there. So they knew for a fact that she didn't spend the night at home. The lady, uh, this woman is saying that she then brought the problem again to her husband to who he, like, did not do ne- did not do anything. So she's asking us, what can she do to get her husband more involved in the education of the kids? What do you guys think she should do? Should the man step up more? Or should, she, should he stay back, watch, and relax? Well, uh, when you decide to write to us, you got to know I got to bring you the way I see things. So, number one, I think the man is right by not stepping in. Uh, I didn't read, like, the full story of anything like that, but she always referred to the other girl as, uh, like, a step-niece, right? She always used that word, step. And in our culture, once someone live in the same house with you, there's no step, there's no half-brother, there's no step-brother. They are just brother, period. When you put step, when you put half, that differentiate. That means that you're already showing, just by your word, a differences in treatment between what is yours and what is not yours. 
So we got to make that clear first. Number two, the main job is to only step in when things get escalated. Education comes for, to the right of women, right? The men step in when the woman is like at her limits, right? Where she things got out of control, then he's that authority figure that come and fix everything that is broken. Right now, the first mistake they made is apparently the lady was playing like friends and friends. Like she tried to take the she tried to take the nineteen year old as a friend, like a friend that she has outside of the home. Like you know, like when you have your friend, you guys play like that. No, when someone send you their kids and they are under your uh how like they are under your authority, you cannot treat them as friend. You have to, they, they have to know that there's a boundary between the mother of the house and the niece in this case, because this is her husband's niece. They have to know that there's some type of boundary. If they don't know that there's some type of boundary, then you will not ever look into their eyes as an authority figure. They will always look at look at you like that person they can have fun with. No, that is not how it's supposed to be. Yes, we can have fun, but there has to be boundary. Like, she went to a point where she would uh, leave her phone at home and the lady would literally, uh, her niece would literally get inside her phone, even answer her phone call. Like, what kind of bad education is that? Like, first of all, man, when I was growing up, if my dad or my mom ever leave their phone and I even, like, smell it, like, even come close to it, man, I was a dead man. Like, when your parent phone ring, you tell them, like, hey, mom, hey, dad, your phone is ringing. It's up to them to tell it, to tell you, bring it to me. Then you go touch the phone to bring it to them. You don't sit back, relax, and... Uh, answering your parent phone call and everything. Oh, hell no, man. You were a dead man if you ever did that. So, in this situation, I just think that she needs to sit back with her husband again and kind of say, you know what? I am out of it. You know, uh, this is bigger than me and I need you to step in. Then, he will step in. But if you just keep nagging like little problem, they, you complain about this. Oh, money is not in the house. Like, uh, such and such did this, such and such. Like, he will never take you seriously because it's like the same common story that keep coming over and over. But once you step in and be like, okay, I am out of work. I need you to step in in this one. Then he will understand this is serious. It's time for him to really step up and see what is not going on and and see what is going on okay guys that was it for uh today podcast and please if you have question feel please feel free to write me on my uh dm me on my instagram you know bstef77 on ig on twitter at number stefan and facebook page you know you can always reach out to me and Let's have some fun with this, man. I want to see how many episodes I can do. So this was one episode. And uh, the next episode, I got a better story for you. And women, men, uh, uh, step up and listen to the next episode because I have a story of the day that you got. Maybe I might just not talk about anything else but the story of the day so that we can really explain it to you know to the fullest uh that being said god bless have a great day whatever project you are trying to do please my brother stay focused on it and doing it please my sister stay focused on doing it and uh, work hard for what you want you have to choose right do you want to be the lion or do you want to be the sheep i chose to be a king <laughs> i chose to be the lion so you have to decide what you want to do i'm doing postcards and you also can invest in yourself. Find a way for your economic, uh, your economic uh, uh, status in this society. You got to find who you are. That being said, again, one more time, God bless, peace, and see you to the next episode. Mm-hmm.